I have standards. I, you have a way that you want to run your business. I have standards. I have a way that I think works. I request that in my presence. Diana Ross would be forever regarded as an icon. Renowned for her bold fashion choices and timeless classics, she has graced the entertainment world for over half a century, leaving an indelible mark in the industry. But her success has definitely not been without its lows. She is now about 80 years old, and with all the success that she has attained, she is still far from being the happiest person that we all thought she would be. In today's video, we will reveal the whole truth about her life. Let's dive in. Early Life and Family The iconic American singer and actress Diana Ross entered the world in Detroit, Michigan on March 26, 1944, setting the stage for a remarkable life. Born to Ernestine and Fred Ross Sr., Diana was the second of six siblings. Interestingly, a clerical error on the birth certificate resulted in her official name being Diana instead of her intended name, Diane. Yet, in the close-knit circles of friends and family in Detroit, she was always affectionately referred to as Diana. Raised in a Baptist household, Diana shared her formative years with her parents and siblings. The Ross family, consisting of three brothers, Wilbert, Fred Jr., and Barbara, as well as two sisters, Barbara and Rita, initially called the Vibrant Neighborhood near Highland Park, Michigan, their home. An intriguing twist of fate placed the young Diana Ross in proximity to greatness, as the renowned Smokey Robinson was their next-door neighbor, a fact that would later add a touch of stardust to her upbringing. However, fate dealt a challenging hand when Diana's mother fell severely ill with tuberculosis when she was just seven years old. Faced with the harsh reality of her mother's illness, Diana's parents made a heart-wrenching but necessary decision. In a bid to ensure her mother's proper recovery and the well-being of the children, Diana, along with her brothers, was sent to live with their maternal grandparents, Mrs. William Moten and Reverend William Moten. This period saw the family relocating to Besser, Alabama, where Reverend William Moten served as the pastor of the Besser Baptist Church. Upon her mother's recovery, Diana, now armed with resilience gained through life's challenges, reunited with her siblings and returned to the bustling city of Detroit. It was in this vibrant urban backdrop that Diana Ross, against all odds, embarked on her extraordinary journey as an entertainer, leaving an indelible mark on the world of music and performing arts. Personal Struggles, Roots, and Aspirations At the age of 14 in 1958, Diana's family underwent a significant transition, relocating to the working-class Brewster Douglas housing developments on St. Antoine Street in Detroit. This move marked a profound change for the family, introducing them to a new chapter of life. Despite the challenges, Diana's tenacity shone through as she embraced this transformation. Immersing herself in her studies, Diana attended the prestigious Cass Technical High School, a downtown Detroit preparatory magnet school and four-year college. Her aspirations at the time were nothing short of extraordinary. She dreamt of becoming a fashion designer. At Cass Tech, Diana delved into various classes, mastering the art of pattern making, tailoring, millinery, and fashion design. Her pursuit of excellence in fashion was coupled with a zest for learning, as she also dedicated herself to modeling and cosmetology classes during weekends and evenings. Notably, the generous support from Smokey Robinson, who provided the necessary funds for these classes, added a heartwarming dimension to her journey. Diana's enthusiasm extended beyond academics, as she joined her school's swim team and actively engaged in other extracurricular activities. Her energy and drive set her apart, foreshadowing the remarkable trajectory she was destined to follow. Venturing into the workforce for the first time in 1960, Diana secured a position as a bus girl at Hudson's, a renowned department store in downtown Detroit. This move was groundbreaking, as she became the first African-American bus girl at Hudson's, a proof of her resilience and an early turning point in her budding career. In a display of both skill and entrepreneurial spirit, Diana offered hairdressing services to her neighbors, showcasing her determination to augment her income. In January 1962, Diana Ross proudly graduated from Cass Tech, signaling the end of her academic journey. 
Little did she know that this pivotal moment would serve as the launching pad for her illustrious career in the entertainment world, setting the stage for the extraordinary achievements that lay ahead. From Primettes to Supremes. Diana Ross embarked on her extraordinary journey into the world of music in 1958, capturing the spotlight at the tender age of 15 when she became a part of the dazzling Primettes. This sensational sister group was intricately linked to the renowned male vocal ensemble, The Primes, forming a powerhouse collective under the discerning eye of music manager Milton Jenkins. A pivotal moment occurred when Paul Williams, a member of The Primes, recognized Diana's exceptional talent and brought her to the attention of the industry. The Primettes, featuring the remarkable lineup of Diana Ross, Betty McGlown, Florence Ballard, and Mary Wilson, showcased their brilliance by triumphing in a prestigious 1960 talent contest in Windsor, Ontario. This triumph caught the discerning ears of Motown Records president and accomplished songwriter Robert Bateman, who, impressed by their performance, urged them to audition. Diana Ross swiftly became renowned for her awe-inspiring live performances, leaving an indelible mark at sock hops on various occasions. With aspirations set on Motown, Diana Ross turned to her former neighbor and supposed boyfriend, William Smokey Robinson, seeking guidance. In a remarkable turn of events, Smokey proposed that the pre-Mets audition for him first before considering Motown. An agreement was reached. The Primettes would make this pivotal move, allowing Marv Tarplin, the guitarist for the Primettes, to join Smokey Robinson's group, The Miracles, for an upcoming tour. Diana Ross perceived this arrangement, leading to Marv Tarplin's enduring and significant role with Robinson's bands as a fair exchange. In their audition for Motown, the Primettes showcased their talent in front of the label's executives. Motown founder Barry Gordy was captivated by the sheer brilliance of Diana Ross's vocals, particularly when she delivered a mesmerizing rendition of There Goes My Baby. This serendipitous encounter left Gordy in awe, and he offered valuable advice, urging the group to complete high school before fully pursuing their careers with Motown. Undeterred by this counsel, the Primettes began making regular visits to Motown's Hitsville, USA headquarters, contributing hand claps and backing vocals to Motown tracks. During this period, Diana Ross assumed multifaceted roles within the group, acting as the seamstress, makeup artist, hairstylist, and costume designer. After Betty McGlown was succeeded by Barbara Martin in late 1960, the Primettes earned the privilege of recording at Hitsville studio. Smokey Robinson, then the vice president of Motown, penned a series of early songs including Breathtaking Guy and Your Heart Belongs to Me. Despite their regional success, these tracks did not achieve national stardom, marking a fascinating chapter in Diana Ross's journey to musical prominence. The Supremes Era In a momentous turn of events, Barry Gordy granted his consent to sign the burgeoning band in January 1961, but not without a condition a name change. Florence Ballard, a member of the Dynamic Primettes, exhibited astuteness in selecting the name Supremes, a choice distinguished by its absence of an ETA. The brilliance of this decision showcased Ballard's keen insight into creating an identity that would resonate uniquely. Diana Ross, ever the visionary, harbored concerns that the new name might be misconstrued as belonging to a male vocal group. However, Despite these reservations, on January 15, 1961, Barry Gordy officially inked the deal, welcoming the group into the Motown family under their new identity, the Supremes. This was a moment of change, setting the stage for a remarkable journey. As the group evolved, undergoing changes with Barbara Martin's departure in 1962, it transitioned into a trio by 1963. Diana Ross, with her unparalleled vocal prowess, stepped into the spotlight as the lead singer, bringing an extraordinary dimension to the ensemble. This transformative period laid the foundation for what would become an unmatched run of success. The Supremes achieved their breakthrough in 1964 with the iconic release of Where Did Our Love Go? This monumental track not only secured their first number one hit, but also served as the catalyst for a spectacular era of triumphs, solidifying the Supreme's status as trailblazers in the world of music, personal life, and marriage scandal. In 1965, the captivating Diana Ross officially embraced a significant change 
by formally altering her name from Diane, her original birth name, to the now iconic Diana. During this period, Diana initiated a romantic relationship with Motown CEO Barry Gordy, marking a fascinating chapter in her personal life. The two remained romantically entwined for several years, creating a dynamic power couple within the music industry. This relationship bore witness to a groundbreaking moment in August 1971 when Diana Ross welcomed her eldest child, Rhonda Suzanne Silverstein, into the world. Notably, the upbringing of Rhonda Suzanne Silverstein took a unique turn as Diana Ross's former husband, the influential music mogul Robert Ellis Silverstein, assumed the role of raising Rhonda. This unprecedented twist added a touch of complexity to the family dynamics. It wasn't until Rhonda reached the age of 13 that Diana Ross chose to unveil the truth about her biological parentage, revealing that Barry Gordy was, in fact, her biological father. Before this revelation, Rhonda affectionately referred to Gordy as Uncle B.B. Within the confines of her marriage to Robert Ellis Silverstein, Diana Ross experienced the joy of motherhood, giving birth to two daughters. Chudney Lane Silverstein joined the family in 1975, followed by the birth of Tracy Joy Silverstein, later recognized as the talented Tracy Ellis Ross, in 1972. The year 1977 brought a significant turning point as Diana Ross and Robert Ellis Silverstein chose to part ways, finalizing their divorce. This marked the conclusion of a chapter in Ross's personal life, setting the stage for new beginnings and further contributing to the captivating narrative of her extraordinary journey. Transitioning to a solo career. In May 1970, the incomparable Diana Ross embarked on her solo journey with the release of her debut solo album, a momentous endeavor that marked the beginning of a remarkably successful solo career. Diana Ross's solo prowess reached new heights with the 1971 release of I'm Still Waiting, a song that not only resonated with audiences but also secured her first UK number one record, further solidifying her global musical impact. That same year, Ross dazzled audiences in her debut solo television special, Diana, featuring a memorable collaboration with the Jackson 5. Undeterred by challenges, Diana Ross ventured into the realm of acting with her debut movie, Lady Sings the Blues, released in 1972. This cinematic masterpiece, a heartwarming biography of jazz and blues legend Billie Holiday, showcased Ross's acting prowess. Despite initial opposition, she garnered acclaim for her portrayal, earning praise from jazz journalist Leonard Feather for her skillful encapsulation of Billie Holiday. Ross's performance earned her Academy Award and Golden Globe nominations, while the film's soundtrack achieved phenomenal success, selling two million copies and reaching number one on the Billboard 200 chart. In November 1972, Diana Ross graced the children's album Free to Be You and Me with her rendition of When We Grow Up, showcasing her versatility and commitment to diverse musical expressions. Continuing her musical reign, Ross achieved her second number one hit in the U.S. with the soulful ballad Touch Me in the Morning in 1973. This year also witnessed the international success of Diana and Marvin, a duet album with fellow Motown artist Marvin Gaye. Ross embarked on an extensive tour, making history in Japan as the first performer invited to a private meeting with Emperor Hirohito's wife at the Imperial Palace. Breaking barriers, Diana Ross made history by becoming the first African-American woman to co-host the Academy Awards in April 1974, showcasing her multifaceted talents. The following year, she delivered her fourth solo number one hit, Love Hangover a dynamic track that seamlessly transitioned from a seductive ballad to an energetic disco anthem, capturing the essence of Ross's musical versatility. In 1976, Ross commenced her wildly popular An Evening with Diana Ross tour, leaving an indelible mark with a two-week run at Broadway's Palace Theatre and an Emmy-nominated television special. The special featured Ross embodying iconic figures like Bessie Smith, Ethel Waters, and Josephine Baker, showcasing her extraordinary range and earning her a special Tony Award for outstanding performance. A pinnacle of her musical journey came in 1980 with the release of the album Diana, featuring chart-topping hits like I'm Coming Out and Upside Down. 
This marked a zenith in Ross's career, resonating with a younger dance audience and solidifying her status as a timeless musical icon. Collaborating with Lionel Richie on the 1981 duet ballad Endless Love proved to be another crowning achievement, securing Ross her sixth and final number one song on the Billboard Hot 100. In 1985, Diana Ross embarked on a personal journey, meeting Norwegian shipping mogul Arne Nice Jr., whom she married in 1986. The union expanded her family, introducing her as a stepmother to Nias's three older children and later welcoming their two sons, Ross Arne and Evan Olav. Despite the challenges, including Nice's extramarital affair, the marriage endured until 2000. Throughout her life, Diana Ross cherishes her large and loving family, which has expanded to include seven grandchildren. Her journey as a grandmother began in 2009 when her daughter, Rhonda, gave birth to Rafe Hawk, adding a new and cherished dimension to Ross's extraordinary legacy. Later, career achievements. After over 20 years of association, Diana Ross started negotiations to leave her longtime record company Motown in 1980. Motown awarded her a $250,000 severance package, and RCA Records made Ross an incredible offer, a $20 million seven-year recording contract that allowed her complete production control over her albums. She asked Barry Gordy, the head of Motown, if he could match RCA's offer before joining them. But Gordy said it was not possible. As a result, on May 20, 1981, Diana Ross signed a record deal with RCA worth the highest sums of money in music history. Ross released her first RCA album, Why Do Fools Fall in Love, in October 1981. Over a million copies of the record were sold, making it a commercial success. Hit hits like Mirror Mirror and her rendition of the timeless hymn Why Do Fools Fall in Love were among them. In addition to starting her production firm, Anide Productions, Ross dabbled in real estate investing after joining RCA. She carried on doing lengthy domestic and international tours. Diana Ross received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on May 6, 1982. After Why Do Fools Fall in Love became popular, she released Silk Electric, an album that included the smash song Muscles, which was written and produced by Michael Jackson. Ross received a Grammy nomination and another top 10 smash with this song. In the end, the album was certified gold. In 1984, Diana Ross released an album called Swept Away, which included the duet All of You with Julio Iglesias. The album also featured the single Missing You, written as an homage to Marvin Gaye, which became a global smash. The sales of Swept Away reached a gold record. The lead single Chain Reaction from her 1985 album Eaten Alive, produced by Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees, peaked at number one in the UK and other countries. The title track, a joint effort by Michael Jackson and Barry Gibb, also performed admirably. The accompanying music videos aided the success of both songs. During the USA for Africa's 1985 fundraising record, We Are the World, Diana was featured. The song went on to sell over 20 million copies worldwide. She hosted the 13th annual American Music Awards in 1986 and the event the following year. On December 30, 2002, Diana Ross was involved in a noteworthy incident that left her in a legal jam. She was receiving treatment for substance misuse at a Tucson, Arizona rehabilitation center at the time. Ross ran into legal issues during her recovery when she was pulled up for driving while intoxicated. Diana Ross was held legally responsible for her acts after her arrest. After that, she was given a two-day jail sentence close to her Connecticut estate. This sentence was one of the legal consequences of her arrest for driving while intoxicated. Two years after recovery, Diana and her daughter, Tracy Ellis Ross, appeared on the cover of Essence magazine in May 2004 as a part of the publication's 50th anniversary celebration. She was the main artist for a Stevie Wonder tribute at the 2004 Billboard Music Awards Century Award on December 8th, and she also took part in the Hope TV concert Tsunami Aid in January 2005, which raised money for the victims of the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake. She then debuted her MAC Icon makeup line as a part of the beauty company's Icon series on January 20th, 2005. 
Ross and Rod Stewart performed a duet of the Gershwin classic, I've Got a Crush on You, in 2005, as a part of Stewart's CD, Thanks for the Memory, The Great American Songbook, Volume 4. After being released as a promotional single, the song peaked at number 19 on the Billboard Hot Adult Contemporary chart. In addition, Ross and Westlife collaborated on a rendition of her 1991 hit song, When You Tell Me That You Love Me, which became successful on the charts, peaking at number one in Ireland and number two in the UK singles chart. Diana Ross received special recognition as a guest at Oprah Winfrey's Legends Ball weekend in 2005, celebrating 25 African-American women in entertainment, art, and civil rights. Later, ABC broadcasted the weekend as a one-hour show. In March 2006, TV Land Awards viewers chose Ross's broadcasted Central Park concerts, dubbed For One and For All, as the best music moment on television. In 2007, she was recognized at the Kennedy Center Honors and given the BET Awards Lifetime Achievement Award. Ross gave a tribute to Billie Jean King at the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament's opening ceremony on August 28, 2008. In Oslo, Norway, she was the main performer for the 2008 Nobel Peace Prize concert. Ross was the main act at the yearly Symphonica in Rosso concert series in October 2009, which took place in the Gelredome Stadium in Arnhem, Netherlands. Her first headline tour in three years, the More Today Than Yesterday, The Greatest Hits Tour, began in 2010. Positive reviews were received countrywide for this tour, which was devoted to remembering her late friend Michael Jackson. Diana Ross received her Hall of Fame induction in 2011 from the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends. She revealed the Album of the Year candidates and accepted her first Grammy Award for Lifetime Achievement in February 2012. Later, in December 2012, she appeared at the Christmas in Washington event sponsored by the White House, which former President Obama attended. She completed two tours in 2013 and was honored with the Ella Fitzgerald Award on July 3, 2014, at the Montreal International Jazz Festival for her contributions to modern jazz singing. In 2015, Ross appeared in the music video for How to Live Alone, a song written and performed by her son, Evan Ross. In April 2015, she started a mini-residency at the Venetian in Las Vegas, entitled The Essential Diana Ross, Some Memories Never Fade. Motown Universal released Diana Ross Sings Songs from the Wiz, an album that was recorded in 1978 on November 27, 2015. Covers of songs from the film adaptation of The Wiz, in which Ross starred with Michael Jackson, Nipsey Russell, Ted Ross, Richard Pryor, and Lena Horne, were included on the CD. Ross's In the Name of Love tour, which she started in 2013, was restarted in February 2016. President Obama awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom on November 22, 2016. Diana Ross was listed as the 50th most successful dance club musician of all time by Billboard magazine in December 2016. She was the main attraction at the 2017 Essence Festival in New Orleans on June 30th, opening the show with her daughter, Rhonda Ross Kendrick. Ross sang several of her hits while accepting the American Music Awards Lifetime Achievement Award on November 19th, 2017. In Ain't No Mountain High Enough... The last song of her performance, she invited all her grandchildren to the stage along with her children and their spouses, her first ex-husband, Robert Ellis, Smokey Robinson, and Motown founder, Barry Gordy. Ross appeared on the Home Shopping Network in December 2017 to sell Diamond Diana, her debut fragrance. The scent ran out in a matter of hours. Diamond Diana, a tie-in CD retrospective of her music, was released concurrently with the scent. It peaked at five on the top album sales chart and six on the Billboard R&B albums chart. Ain't No Mountain High Enough 2017, the first single off the CD, was remixed by Eric C.R. and peaked at number one on the Billboard Dance Club Songs chart. Diana Ross was listed as the third most successful dance club musician of all time in December 2018 by Billboard magazine. Ross received recognition from the Recording Academy at the 61st Annual Grammy Awards on February 10th, 2019. She gave renditions of The Best Years of My Life and Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand. Eric Cooper's remix of her song The Boss from 2019 became The Boss 2019 Inches 
and peaked at number one on Billboard's top dance chart on April 13th. In May 2020, Diana Ross released Supertonic Mixes, a compilation of nine of her biggest hits that Eric Cupper had remixed. The remixes gave these timeless songs new life, which drew in a new audience. Supertonic Mixes was released on CD and pristine vinyl LP in July 2020. The song Turn Up the Sunshine, which Ross co-wrote with the psychedelic pop group Tame Impala, was released in May 2022. This song was the lead single from Minions, the Rise of Gru's original soundtrack album. Turn Up the Sunshine was a modern addition to the album, which featured new takes on beloved 1970s favorites by performers including Brittany Howard, St. Vincent, H.I.R., and others. Diana Ross performed as the star finale act at the Platinum Party at the Palace on June 4, 2022, in honor of Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee. On June 10, 2022, she opened the UK leg of her Thank You Tour in Cardiff Castle, continuing to wow crowds. Then, on June 26, she performed live on the Pyramid Stage at Glastonbury Festival, enthralling the audience with an ageless show. Diana Ross's impact and influence are still acknowledged and cherished by fans and fellow artists. After 80 years of establishing her career, what are your thoughts on Diana Ross's life? Please share your thoughts with us in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.